it's very much dug deep. Um, and we've already heard quite a lot this morning, haven't we, about frailty and the unique challenges which it poses to us as we look after older surgical patients. And as an audience of predominantly geriatricians, I think, this is of course something that we're quite familiar with. And within our own academic literature, we're quite used to looking at the concept of frailty and the models of frailty. But what's been interesting as we've seen this change in the surgical demographic that we heard about this morning is that this concept of frailty is now increasingly being discussed in both the surgical and the anaesthetic literature. So just an example on that slide there, um, quite a high profile paper from JAMA at the end of last year. And that was the kind of thing that 20 years ago we would not have been seeing in surgical and anaesthetic literature. So although this audience are quite familiar with frailty, I think before we look at what the, the surgical and anaesthetic literature says about older, frailer surgical patients, it's always worth just recapping the basics of frailty and the way that we've conceptualised this within our literature. So broadly speaking, what, what do we mean by frailty? Well, of course, we know that it's one of those so-called geriatric syndromes. And essentially, it's a decreased physiological reserve, which occurs across a number of different organ systems, such that the frail patient is then very vulnerable to what we might think is actually quite a minor external stressor or insult. And of course, if we think about so-called normal aging, we see a similar decrease across all organ systems and a decrease in functional reserve, as we see on the right of the slide here. And this occurs in both neuronal function and cardiorespiratory reserve in terms of renal function. But what's different in the frail patient is that this decrease seems to be accelerated and it also seems to get to a point where homeostatic failure then occurs and the patient can't bounce back from these little insults like they could when they hadn't reached this threshold of homeostatic failure. And this is just shown pictorially really here. So you see that as the patient gets towards the edge of that cliff, their physiological reserve, they don't have that anymore. A little stressor comes along and really then quite a profound precipitous event occurs which wouldn't happen if they'd had better reserve. So that can be the things that we see day to day in our clinical practice. A patient who was independent very quickly and profoundly becoming quite dependent or a patient who is ambulant then becoming immobile from something that we might might think it's quite small, a day case procedure or a simple uncomplicated urinary tract infection, or a lucid patient who then becomes delirious. So just to recap on, this, on the models of frailty that we've seen described in the, the geriatric literature over the last 15, 20 years or so, um, and really both of these models, the frailty phenotype and the frailty index, which we'll be familiar with, were described from very big population type databases where a huge number of variables were collected longitudinally in older patients. So the first of these, the frailty phenotype, really describes five frailty defining criteria and then talks about the effect that these criteria have on outcomes for patients, so things like falls, poor mobility, and ultimately hospitalisation and death. And the frailty defining criteria we can see on the left of the slide here. And when Freed first described this model, she described it in three categories. So if you had none of these five, you were sort of robust and non-frail. If you had one or two out of the five, you were described as pre-frail. And then if you had three or more of the five, this was a, a frankly frail group of patients. So it's a categorical type score. If you compare it to the slightly more recently described frailty index, or sometimes called deficit accumulation model of frailty, this is exactly as it's described. Essentially, it reflects a number of deficits accrued by a patient across a multi-domain assessment. So the kinds of variables that they collected were a mixture of things from current illnesses to comorbidity and multimorbidity to physical signs to problems completing ADLs and managing at home. So really across a number of different domains. And what they did was they just calculated the number of deficits that the patient had over the number of deficits that had been counted up. And in the original study, this was actually 92. And it gives you a score from 0 to 1, an index, or 0 to 92 deficits, effectively. And when they look at this index, they think that actually patients start to get problems with frailty at about a, an index of 0 0.25. And 
what's been interesting as the literature has kind of developed on the frailty index is that actually you don't have to collect the original variables that Rockwood and their team collected. You can calculate this frailty index on any set of multi-domain data which you're collecting as part of research. So it's fairly translatable, we think, into other work that's going on. And the other thing that's emerged that's quite interesting is that once you accumulate a certain threshold of deficits, effectively you can't go on. There's a, there's a limit to how much one person can take before life is no longer compatible. And that happens at about 0.6 to about 0.7, we think, from the literature. So this is more of a, of a um, continuous scale as opposed to the categorical scale described before. And of course, there are going to be problems with the way that we describe these things and the way we conceptualise it. And there's always going to be difficulties in what we include in such models. So you'll notice that the first of those doesn't have cognitive frailty included, whereas, of course, all of us think that frailty and cognitive problems always go hand in hand in the patients we're looking after. Um, and what about socio-demographic measures and the input they have, and what about affective disorders? But regardless of these controversies and the debate that we have in the literature, we know that this is a common problem, so it's something that we're all going to be facing. And if you look at the studies in um, elective surgical patients, somewhere approaching about half of these patients pitching up for elective non-cardiac and cardiac surgery are going to be frail on a variety of different tools used to measure this. So to put this percentage into some kind of perspective, we see from data on community dwelling patients that actually Actually, less than 10% of 65 to 74 year old community dwellers will be deemed as frail. Whereas right at the other end of the spectrum, in, in our care home um, population in the UK, the majority of patients who make it into a care home are going to be frail. So actually half of patients pitching up for elective surgery being deemed as frail really suggests they're quite a vulnerable group. And as we've heard this morning, this is the elective group, never mind the emergency group, who we think probably actually are a frailer bunch anyway. And it's always worth, when we're thinking about frailty, just remembering those overlapping geriatric syndromes. So, of course, these aren't exclusively syndromes in older patients, but we commonly see sarcopenia and we commonly see cachexia as patients age. And there's quite a lot of overlap in both the etiology of these conditions with imbalances in pro- and anti-inflammatory cytokines thought to be causative, and also in the phenotype that the patient expresses, so problems with um, grip strength, gait speed, and, and skeletal mu muscle function. But of course these are still discrete clinical entities and not, or whilst most frail people are sarcopenic, not all frail individuals are cachectic and only some sarcopenic patients are also frail, so they do remain as discrete entities. So this can be quite difficult then to pick out the frail patient and we commonly use this in language, don't we, oh they're a bit frail, but actually if we're trying to be a bit more scientific and actually measure this, when we know that there's such a difference in older patients and we know that there's such an overlap between competing geriatric syndromes, how can we accurately identify frailty in this group? And of course you'll be aware that there's loads of different scales and scores and techniques that we can use. And the, the, t the scale or the, the score that you use is going to depend on what you're trying to do. So for a, a, a general practitioner looking at their practice population and seeing who they might screen, they're going to need a completely different tool from a junior surgeon in the emergency department in the middle of the night clerking a patient who's likely to have an emergency laparotomy the next day. So there's a number of different measures, whether single or sort of surrogate scores like gait speed, or timed up and go, or more specific multi-domain scores that better reflect the multi-domain nature of frailty. And actually, although lots of these scores have been around for quite a long time, surprisingly the majority of them still haven't been very well validated or evaluated in terms of clinometrics and their properties and how they operate in different groups. Just for those who might not have come across any of these scales, this is just a, a snapshot of the clinical frailty scale based on Kenneth Rockwood's um, frailty index. So based on a clinical assessment of a patient, you can then assign them to one of these categories. This is um, the Edmonton Frail Scale that I know a lot of people use in their services, and this is the scale that we're currently using preoperatively within the POPS clinic as well. Um, and there's some nice things about this scale. It's, it's quick to do. It takes less than five minutes. It can be done by a, a, a non-health professional, so by a trained lay assistant. It's been validated in that population. It gives us a score from 0 to 17 with some quite nice properties. It's normally distributed in older patients. It's got good inter-rater reliability. Um, 
Um, and actually, practically, it's quite nice because it can highlight the areas where your patients are scoring high. You can see what's making them frail and what's giving them that high score. So there's kind of a practical application of it as well. So if we've t chosen one of these tools and we've measured frailty, what's the point in doing that? What is the impact of frailty? And we know, of course, that on a population basis, ultimately frailty leads to dependence, to hospitalisation or institutionalisation, and ultimately to death. We see this in home care recipients who are much more likely to go on to increased levels of dependence. And we see that when coupled with other geriatric syndromes, so in this example here, delirium, of course there's much worse survivals in patients who have these coexisting geriatric syndromes. So it's no surprise that in our surgical population, of course, we see that frailty is also predictive of increased morbidity and mortality. And this, is, um, this slide just essentially summarises the main papers in elective surgery looking at the impact of frailty. And really it just highlights the heterogeneity in the studies. There's numerous different tools used to measure frailty, loads of different outcome measures. But despite this heterogeneity, the message is the same, that when patients are frail, they have more post-operative complications, they stay in hospital longer, and then they're more likely to die during that admission and then die within 30 days of the hospitalisation. And we see here that when coupled with the ASA score commonly used by anaesthetists when they pre-assess patients, that when you couple ASA with frailty, it's far more predictive of adverse outcomes. So this study was 600 patients undergoing elective non-cardiac surgery, and what it showed that it was predictive of institutionalisation at discharge and of post-operative morbidity. So if we're going to assess patients for frailty before surgery, what are we going to do about it? Should we assess them for frailty and then, and then ration surgery on the basis of say, we think you're too high risk, let's not do it? Or should we use it, as we've heard, as a kind of tool to facilitate shared decision making and, and a point around which we can have that discussion about best interest, what does the patient want, what does this mean in numbers and terms that they understand? Or should we be using frailty as a kind of tool or a lever to try and modify that risk so that actually we can get patients through surgery with better outcomes. And of course this is really a description of preoperative risk assessment, isn't it? That's the point of assessing anybody before surgery, to not operate on people who wouldn't benefit from surgery, to explain the risk properly to them and their relatives, and then to try and modify the risk. But it raises certain questions when we're thinking about frailty, because if we are going to try and intervene to modify the syndrome, where are we going to intervene? Shall we get involved very early in the elective pathway and do a lot of things to patients delaying their surgery to really try and modify this frailty syndrome? Or actually, should we be liaising more with anaesthetic colleagues? Is there anything we can do at the time of operation in theatre that's really going to make a difference to these post-operative outcomes? Are we really talking about a rescue mission here? Not much point doing anything up front, but don't worry, let's be proactive once they've had their surgery and we'll treat medical complications in a standardised way. We'll get people out of bed, we'll rehabilitate them actively. Are we talking about the end of the surgical pathway? And if we are going to intervene at any point in that pathway, what is it that we're actually going to do? We don't have a frailty drug or a, a frailty treatment that we can use, so what are we going to do? And broadly speaking, the literature on looking at modifying the frailty syndrome falls into these three things, exercise, a little bit of discussion around pharmacology, and then nutrition, which I know we're going to hear about later. So to just briefly look at these and the, with the surgical anaesthetic literature in mind, we know that in frail community dwelling and in frail care home residents, we think that exercise can improve mobility, functional ability and muscle strength in a very frail group. So there's some evidence that this is a sensible thing to do and it's certainly very intuitive, isn't it, when you look at the things in the frailty syndrome that patients have. So what about prehabilitation, which we hear discussed a lot? Well, we know from recent systematic reviews that prehabilitation does improve physical fitness in patients having elective surgery, and it's safe. And actually, we've got safety data now on looking at patients with quite big abdominal aortic aneurysms and putting them on exercise bikes and stressing them, putting their blood pressure up, and we think it's safe. So we have data on this now. We've seen from other studies that if you do inspiratory muscle prehabilitation, you can reduce post-operative pulmonary complications, predominantly, think, we think, through reducing atelectasis. 
But what we don't have yet in our prehab literature is very solid data that prehabilitation is going to impact on hard surgical outcomes, so things like post-operative complications and mortality. Now that isn't because it won't, it's just because we don't yet have the studies to prove it. And I think certainly most of us would agree that it's a very intuitive, sensible thing with a biological basis behind it. So I'm sure we'll see that we do get increased benefit from prehabilitation as these studies are done. What about if we go to the end of the surgical pathway? What about when a patient's had an operation? What about rehabilitation? Do we have any evidence that this is actually doing these surgical patients any good? We do it day in, day out. And actually, no, we don't have great data about it. And we heard from Jugdeep earlier about those functional outcomes and how it can take six months or more for patients to get anywhere near their pre-morbid level of functioning after surgery. So this paper here just looked at patients after hip fracture. And it did show that if you um, rehabilitate patients after a fracture, they do demonstrate improved physical function and quality of life. But we don't have a lot of hard data, again, on impacting further complications and mortality. So moving on to nutrition, um, and before you look at nutrition um, and nutritional interventions in frailty, it's always worth just remembering um, the U-shaped curve you get when you plot body mass index against the proportion of patients who are frail. Because of course, although we think of it as a kind of wasting condition, actually as you see there, it's those with a very low and those with a very high BMI who tend to do worse in terms of frailty. So data is emerging that in the patients who are frail with a high BMI, actually perhaps we shouldn't just be looking at nutritional supplementation but we should be looking at specific supplementation of certain deficits with exercise to try and reduce truncal obesity. <laughs> So what can we supplement nutritionally? Well, protein supplementation, if you borrow from the sarcopenia literature, does show benefit in the prevention of sarcopenia. And it does show a reduced amount of time spent in a rehabilitation unit in patients who've had surgery for hip fracture. And we may be hearing later about immunonutrition, which is um, emerging in the critical care literature, but obviously with obvious crossover into the surgical literature. Um, so this is specific nutritional supplements which can alter or attenuate the immune an inflammatory response we see when we get a SERS response. Um, and um, to my reading of the literature, the, the jury's still out a little bit. There are lots of studies that show benefit, but some that show harm. So it'd be interesting if, to hear about that later. And in terms of um, vitamin D supplementation, as the geriatricians in the audience will be aware, we do use this in patients at risk of falls, um, although we don't think it actually specifically modifies the frailty syndrome, although it may have benefit in sarcopenia. So no real single kind of intervention from nutrition or from exercise that's particularly going to modify this syndrome, but certainly lots of avenues where we think there may be benefit and where research may then be answering these questions. What about drugs? Well, of course, we know that we don't have a frailty drug. If we did, we'd all be using it. Um, but lots of different modulators have been attempted in the past, not, not really with very good effect and with quite a lot of side effects. Although there has been discussion about the role of ACE inhibitors in this group and the improvement that this might have on exercise capacity in um, older patients with heart failure. Um, although at the moment, we don't really have any definitive answers on this. So it's not really something that we'd be prescribing for frailty, but it's certainly something to watch out for in the literature. So given that we don't have a single clean nutritional exercise or drug intervention for frailty, but we've got lots of promising avenues, what can we do in terms of more multi-component approaches to try and impact on a, what is actually obviously a multi-domain system? And this was a single site randomised control um, study carried out in, this is actually in um, medical outpatients who were older and frail, it wasn't in surgical patients. But they essentially did CGA and targeted the aspects of frailty that they identified, so weight loss targeted with meal provision and, and dietitian input, geriatricians and specialist nurses um, did chronic disease management and then followed patients up to make sure that what they were doing and optimising was having a benefit. And they followed this group having a multi-component frailty intervention over 12 months. And about 200 patients, and what they found is that they did reduce um, frailty measured using that first phenotypic model we looked at, at 12 months. So essentially they did good CGA and followed people up, and they showed that you might be able to impact the expression of frailty at a 12-month follow-up period.
does this translate into the older surgical population? Um, well, this was a pre and post study, but with matched and unmatched analysis. Um, and they looked at patients aged over 65 having major elective abdominal surgery. And they used three aspects of the HELP model that you may, you'll be hearing about, I'm sure, from Philip later and that you're probably aware of, which was a model set up for patients to try and reduce the impact of delirium. And the three aspects that they targeted in this multi-component approach was early mobilisation after an operation, nutritional assistance, and this was, this was volunteers helping patients to eat their meals and things, it wasn't even build-up drinks, um, and then orientating communication, making sure patients knew where they were and what was going on. And again, nearly 200 patients. Um, and what they showed is that by the time of hospital discharge, they thought they'd reduced frailty in the intervention group, although this wasn't then sustained at three months. But actually, there was no intervention after the patients went home. And as we know from our CGA literature, a lot of good CGA is actually the follow-through and the continuing of medium and longer-term plans to affect change. So we don't have a kind of single intervention that we can employ in frail patients. We think probably we should assess people preoperatively for frailty. And it's sort of emerging data that possibly these multi-component type models might work. And certainly as geriatricians in the audience will probably agree, CGA does work in a lot of settings. We've got data to support that. So this slide I know you saw from um, Jugdeep earlier, but essentially I just flag it up again to show that with frailty, although we don't have a specific paper in elective or emergency surgical patients, what we're doing is trying to pragmatically interpret the academic literature we do have out there to employ this on a day-to-day -day basis for our patients. So in our clinic we will assess people using the Edmonton Frail Scale, using gait speed and using timed up and go. And then we'll then target those aspects of frailty which we've identified. So if it's so social isolation and not managing at home that's the issue, then they'll be referred to our social worker who's in clinic with us in order to see what they can do. If it's a therapy based problem we obviously have therapists to help with that if they're falling and they've got low vitamin D's we'll correct that we'll do that obviously medical optimization that the children the geriatricians doing in the study there and if nutrition's a problem we'll liaise with dietetic colleagues etc so we're pragmatically interpreting the, the avenues we do have looking promising in the literature into a kind of day-to-day -day model and then following those patients up to get them out of bed early to make sure we proactively plan for their discharge and that we treat their medical complications when they occur in quite a standardised fashion. So I think really that's probably the best we can offer at the moment on the available literature. And certainly we think from data we've got emerging that that might well be a way to treat this vulnerable group of patients. But I'm sure that the research literature in this area will really flourish in the next few years and we, we, we'll be seeing better stuff that we can do with this vulnerable group of patients. Thank you.